Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this um, last lecture of the term for 3CL, the Centre for Corporate and Commercial Law. This uh, session is run jointly with the Cambridge Centre for Private Law, and we're very grateful to the Cambridge Centre for Private Law for publicising it and for coming and, and so on. And um, so this session is um, going to be uh, given by uh, Professor Teresa Rodriguez de la Herz Bellal, and she is um, a visiting uh, a visitor, an academic visitor to the law faculty this year. She is Professor of Commercial Law at Carlos Tratera University of Madrid in Spain. Um, but Teresa, I've known for a long time, she's a very international person. And she's worked in all sorts of areas to do with international business transactions, secured transactions, corporate finance, that sort of thing. But at the moment, she's turning her attention to AI and, and basically fintech and the digital economy. Um, she's worked with a number of um, different um, international organizations on this, which she's going to talk about. She's um, worked with the EU and also with UNIDRA, UNCITRAL and the European Law Institute, all thinking about aspects of the digital economy. And so we're very pleased, Teresa, that you'll come here today to tell us about um, AI and automatic decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, for this uh, kind introduction and for the invitation. Thank you very much to both, uh, both centre that has to organise, co-organise this seminar and the co-directors of the, uh, the centre, Felix and, and Louis, Professor Stefek, Professor Galifa. I'm indeed delighted to, to have the opportunity to be with you today and share the main findings of the, this work in progress. It's a project on how to devise the rules and principles from a private law perspective in order to promote the responsible use of algorithm and artificial intelligence in decision-making processes. And the first deliverable, the first outcome that was completed this year in the first term was indeed a set of 12 guiding principles on automated decision-making that I proposed at the beginning of the year and the European Law Institute has adopted as an ELI project, as an ELI instrument. So I would like to discuss with you uh, the background, what I would like to indeed work on this area of responsible algorithm, what that means, what are the kind of challenges and risk that this uh, legal framework, or at least principle-inspired legal framework, would like to mitigate, what are indeed the kind of risks that this principle has tried to face and reduce to the maximum extent possible? And what are the future work that we are elaborating at the moment in order to design this idea of responsible algorithm in the context of transaction? So essentially in the area of private law. And let me please start with the following statement. Automation is key for an over-informed complex digital society. We need automation because we need to process immense amount of data, because we need to adopt the system in extremely complex scenarios, because we really need to curb and reduce uncertainty. And therefore, we need automate tasks and activities, but even more than that, we need to automate decision-making processes. When we combined the possibilities of computing power, big data analytics, uh, immense amount of data coming from a variety of sources, and we combine that with algorithm and artificial intelligence, <laughs> we have probably one of the most enticing, distinctive features of the digital society today. But this distinctive feature, the fact that we are automating decision-making processes, is as well very perturbing is very preoccupying because we realize that there are a lot of risk and concern arising from the fact that a variety of decision making that you can take a look on the screen are indeed decided by automated decision making. Therefore, by algorithm and artificial intelligence techniques without human intervention at every and each action adopted by these decision making, automated decision making processes. We automate a variety of things. We automate very simple tasks, such as rating, prioritizing, ordering, searching, comparing. But we also automate added value, quite sophisticated added value services that has direct impact on the legal status and the contractual status of the affected person. For example, recruiting, for example, ranking, for example, the decision-making in relation to how to allocate resources in the hospital. 
We, for example, automate medical treatment and medical diagnosis. So as you can see, we take into account this idea of automated decision making, the variety of concern multiply. They are indeed ethical consideration. They are concern related to violation of human rights. They are problems related to the invasion of privacy. They are a big concern about algorithmic bias. But what I wanted to do in this project is to focus on the basics of private law. And essentially, I started with a very fundamental question. Are indeed the decision adopted by automated decision-making system valid and enforceable? Can we simply apply the very well-known international principle of functional equivalence in order to consider equal, functionally equivalent, any decision adopted by the automated decision-making, any action, any settlement? any action, performance action, any remedy equivalent to a human-driven decision in any case? Can we compare in terms of legal capacity, error, decision, consent, even the mere idea of agreement? So can we solve all the questions with the existing rules? Let's focus a little bit further on the contract life cycle. So try to devise and imagine a situation where the decision is indeed a contractual decision, for example, a negotiation conducted by Alexa in order to conclude transaction in name and on behalf of the consumer. All the questions that it was trying to, uh, to solve, to answer, are precisely related to, in this triangular relationship, what is indeed the role of this algorithmic agent, algorithmic delegate, purely a tool that the consumer is using for the purpose of manifesting his consent or her consent? What is indeed the legal regime that we have to apply to this triangular relationship? How we should treat error or mistake? Is indeed a problem of error in validating or defect of consent? Or we're talking simply about allocation of risk. So the first set of questions were related to, indeed, trying to understand and to uh, frame the use of artificial intelligence and algorithm in the context of decision-making processes within the traditional context of private law. And then we go a little bit farther and try to decide, indeed, adopt decision. For example, to whom we are going to attribute the legal effect of the decision for example, concluding or negotiating or renegotiating a contract by the automated decision making, to whom to attribute the legal effect. But also, what happens if this kind of automated decision making in the normal or and normal operation cost damages of any nature, of any kind, to whom to allocate the liability, the legal consequences? So the main question of this project is are automated decision-making specific rules necessary? Do we really need to formulate rules in order to provide sufficient certainty in order to guarantee the validity and the enforceability of actions and decisions adopted by or supported by automated decision-making? That is the main question of the project. If you take a look around, and I will make some reference to uh, ongoing initiative at a different uh, regional or international level, you will realize immediately that the main focus has been um, focused today on uh, regulatory requirement, transparency, explainability, monitoring, audit of uh, high-risk automated decision making. But the real question from my perspective is to which extent these legal or regulatory requirements are going to have impact on private law issues, on private law questions. For example, to which extent the fact that the automated decision making is not transparent or cannot be explained properly is going to be impacted on the validity of the contract. Are we going, for example, to have a problem of defect of consent because the affected person is unable to understand the reason why this particular system has adopted that particular specific decision. So to which extent we can really find an interplay 
between legal or regulatory requirements, for example, the one that clearly articulate the future Artificial Intelligence Act in Europe, and what are going to be the impact on private law. So taking this uh, uh, backdrop of my, of my talk, what I would like to discuss with you in the next minute is, first, let me please provide you with the scope of the project, what is an uh, automated decision-making for the purpose of this project, and which are the actors that are involved or might be involved in the operation of automated decision-making. That is going to be fundamental to discuss liability attribution and legal effect allocation as well. Immediately after that, what I would like to discuss with you is, first, how some ongoing project and initiative at different levels, that I will uh, provide some details in a minute, they have started to focus on this idea of um, assessing to which extent existing rules in private law are ready, are suited to automated decision making. To which extent we can apply this idea of technology neutrality and functional equivalence to the full extent in this case or not. And why not? What are the gaps? What are the, uh, the, the, the conflict, the friction between the existing rules and the use of automated decision making? After that, I would like to discuss with you very briefly in order to give you a, a general overview of these 12 principles that I prepare for the European Law Institute, in order to provide you with the, the style, the tone, what were this kind of principle and what is the, the, uh, the, the margin of maneuver that we have using this principle in order to adjust the existing rules to the new scenario. And then we will conclude with the future work. What do we have to do from now onwards? <coughs> What is an automated decision making? This idea of automated decision making is based on a process, a computational process that is fueled or fed by input of any kind. Could be human provided input, could be machine generated input, could be input collected from the environment, a sensor of the autonomous vehicle, or a connection with the social network in a particular credit scoring system. So we have input, that could be, I insist on that, provided intentionally by human beings or could be collected from prediction, previous recommendation, uh, elements from the environment, for example, a smart home system that is collecting data about the temperature, the weather, uh, the, uh, the opening or closing of the gates of the house, all are input. These inputs are fueling the processing, the processing of the system, and this system could be purely deterministic, with an algorithmic model that is essentially a structure, very well-known conditional structure, if A, then B, very clear, very predictable in the outcomes. Or we could add, as the Artificial Intelligence Act in Europe explained, we could add learning capabilities. And that means that we use artificial intelligence techniques, usually described as deep learning, machine learning, and other techniques that, as you can see, instill a level of unpredictability in the outcomes of the system, and second, a level of autonomy in the capacity of deciding by the system. So we are, as you can see, in this fascinating transition from purely automatic system, deterministic, to increasingly autonomous systems, where artificial intelligence technique, as you can see, add the ability to decide within a range of possibilities. All these process conclude, culminate in an output. An output could be, as you can see, as simple as rating, ranking, a recommendation, but could also be a dispute resolution, so a decision, indeed affecting legal and contractual rights. We could have a credit scoring that is going, for example, to render a particular law applicant eligible or non-eligible to be granted that particular loan, for example. We could be in a situation where the output is an offer, an offer that is going to conclude a contract if duly accepted by the other party. So automated decision making, as you can see, cover an extraordinary range of situation where, and this is the key, we have an operator. So the operator is the legal person, the natural person, but usually the legal person who use, with a specific purpose, the automated decision-making. Could be a company 
using the automated decision-making for recruiting or internal promotion. And we have the affected person, the candidate, or the employee. The operator could be a bank that is using credit scoring for the purpose of deciding whether to grant or not um, a loan or a particular um, investment uh, strategy, for example. We could be here, the operator could be a company that is using this ADM in a smart warehouse in order to negotiate, conclude, perform and execute contract in the smart warehouse with providers and clients. So as you can see in all the cases, what is really interesting in my opinion is first, we have a center of gravity here, the operator. The operator is the one who use and benefit from the use of this ADM. And then we have two scenarios that are very interesting in my opinion. The first one is the scenario where the decision of the ADM is subsequently the input for a further decision-making process adopted by the affected person. For example, I am using Netflix or Amazon. I rely on the recommendation proposed by Amazon in order to decide which product to buy. Here we have an affected person that might be misled, might be mistaken because he's relying too much on that recommendation that might be biased, for example. But we also have, as you can see, an indirect effect on third parties. This recommendation could be based on self-preferencing strategies. And that could be maybe a situation where certain traders have been downrated or demoted and therefore indirectly affected by this particular ADM recommendation system, recommendation outcomes. And then we have other, many other situations where the ADM is producing a final decision that is going to impact on the legal status the contractual status of the affected person. I decide to dismiss, to hire, to promote, to downgrade, to uh, contract, to deal, not to deal, to negotiate, not to negotiate, to admit or to refuse. So the affected person is that person that is indeed directly affected by the final decision of the ADM. Now the question is, can we maybe solve this problem by conducting what we call an ADM readiness test or readiness assessment of the existing rules? Can we simply start by assess the adequacy, the suitability of the existing rules, all the basic rules of our contract, private law, contract law, liability rules? Can we do that and then see what are indeed the area for improvement? That is exactly what we are doing in UNCITRAL, in the working group four, where I am. I have the privilege of being a delegate of Spain and therefore participating in the elaboration of this ADM readiness test, using precisely the UN, the United Nations instrument, and trying to see to which extent that works when we use uh, artificial intelligence. Let me give you an example. When we take a look at the existing uh, United Nations instrument, we have the Convention on Electronic Communication for International Trade, adopted in 2005 by United Nations. And there is a provision that apparently is very helpful. It's Article 12 of the Convention, saying that automated contract, or better, contract concluded by automated means are valid and enforceable. Do we have already the solution? Not yet. Why? Because the, the, the philosophy, the rationale behind all this provision in 2005 and before and earlier, they are based on the idea that these kind of systems, even being automated, are systems that simply process a previous decision adopted by human beings. So all the problems are related to the fact of to which extent this automatic processing of the decision creates additional problems such as to whom allocate or to whom attribute that particular decision, who is the originator. They are talking about the first generation of internet. They are talking about essentially communication. Not more than that. The problem now is completely different. The problem is to which extent we are going to accept binding decision adopted without human intervention at all. So adopted from the beginning to the end by automated decision making. And then to whom attribute and allocate the effect. On the other side, the European Union, just a few weeks ago, the 29th of September this year, 
uh, published two very interesting proposals that we have been previously um, elaborating and working on in the expert group on liability and AI. These two proposals are two directives trying precisely to assess the adequacy of liability rules to damages caused by artificial intelligence, to which extent we can use the idea of fault. How can we uh, design the causation link? To which extent we can apply the duty of care standards if we are indeed in the context of full automation of the process? And the third one is what we're doing in the ELI, the European Law Institute, is a project on algorithmic contract that is assisting the European Commission on precisely checking, testing and assessing consumer protection law in Europe in the context of automated decision making. So as you can see, the first stage is, could be, this kind of ADM readiness test. But in my opinion, that was not enough. We need to go further and really try to design a framework, a consistent, coherent, reliable framework of principle. In order to go further, it's not simply a test, what we have is valid or not, maybe it's a burden. Maybe it's in a way undermining our capacity of understanding the real challenge. So in order to understand the real challenge, my proposal was to infer from the existing rules, the existing instrument, in this case in Europe, because it was initially focused on the European Union framework, trying to infer certain principle and build on this principle, this idea of the 12th principle for guiding, for, for automated decision making in Europe. My finding was that even if we can see some references of automation in all these instruments, the GDPR, Article 22, Platform to Business Regulation, DMA, DSA, Artificial Intelligence Act, when will be adopted, even if there are references, definitely they are not a consistent and coherent legal framework for idea. So I proposed 12 principle that try to, in my opinion, um, lay the foundation, uh, provide guidance to policymakers and lawmakers in precisely building up this uh, legal framework for ADM. What I would like to do, Luis, is to focus on two or three of these principles, trying to show you what is the structure, what kind of topics I addressed in the principle, and I will provide you with not only the principle, but also the explanation of each of them. The first set of principles combine principle 1, 2, and 11. For me, the starting point, using the traditional um, style of uncitral principle, is principle 2. It's the principle of non-discrimination against automated decision-making. Seems to be very simple, but it's extremely ambitious. And it's indeed the driving force of everything that we're going to do from now onwards. Why? Because accepting that, as a general rule, an automated decision-making shall not be denied legal effect, so shall not be discriminated as far as legal effect is concerned, solely on the ground that it is automated, is absolutely fundamental. So the starting point is non-discrimination against automated decision-making. The fact that it's automated, at least as a sole ground, will not be sufficient in order to deny validity, deny legal effect, or deny enforceability. Let's combine, please, this principle with the previous one. Seems to be very obvious, but it's extremely important as well, in my opinion, it's crucial. This idea of law-compliant uh, algorithmic or automated decision-making, what that means, essentially two things. The first one is that the design and the use of automated decision-making because we assume that will be valid and enforceable, has to be designed, deployed, and implemented in compliance with applicable law. Which applicable law? The applicable law that should be applicable, that should be applied, in case that exactly the same decision has been adopted by non-automated means. That is the idea. So if we apply a functional equivalence, we always have a mirror in front of us that would be the same decision in a non-automated scenario. The other angle of this principle is also very interesting. That means law-compliant ADM entails that automation cannot be used as a way to circumvent or evade the applicable law. 
So automated decision making is indeed in compliant and has to be in compliant with the applicable law. In combination with that, that is in a way what we already have, what do we want to reach? That is future work. It's not enough to comply with the law. Maybe we have to be mindful, aware, conscious that the use of automation precisely because multiply, amplify, generate vir virality, precisely because of that, we have to be extremely careful, more cautious when we are using algorithm. And this is the idea of responsible idea. For example, uh, trying to avoid the spread of fake news, trying to avoid the natural discrimination against certain communities, trying to avoid stereotype, trying to prevent stigmatization, for example. So the idea is to which extent incorporate certain responsible values in the use and the design of uh, automated decision making. That provides me a lot of use cases that I can share with you in application of this principle. Let me just use the first one. Even if it's related to or could be related to public administration, it's still very, in my opinion, pertinent for our discussion today. Let's imagine a procurement system uh, within the eligible bidder are ranked, are decided, are selected on the basis of a totally and fully automated decision-making system. The shortlisting produced and generated by the automated decision-making will have exactly the same legal effect as human uh, being producing the same result. So that is the natural effect, extremely important because that means that we can apply automated decision-making even without a specific recognition by the law. So we do not know, if you accept this principle, we do not need that the law um, habilitate, acknowledge, enable the parties to use automated decision-making. The equivalence is total and absolute, and we can use it exactly with the same legal effect. If, we do, if you accept that these are the basis, let's go to the next level. And the next level is, okay, we have automated decision making. We have robot in this warehouse adopting decision. We have Alexa uh, doing shopping. We have an autonomous vehicle renting a parking slot in, uh, on the way back home. Uh, but we have a, a system, virtual assistant, uh, producing a medical treatment, medical diagnosis. But the, the real question from a private law perspective is, OK, who is bound by this? To whom we are going to attribute the legal decision adopted by the ADM. And these are the two principles that, in my opinion, are uh, relevant for this discussion. As you can see, the first one is focused on legal effect. So I'm talking about uh, if this is an offer, who is the offerer? If this is a contract, who is the contracting party? If this is um, unfair competition action, who is liable for that? This is the kind of question I'm trying to solve here. The first principle is very obvious and gravitate around the concept of operator. So as you can see, the decision adopted by ADM shall be attributed to the operator. And in order to reinforce this idea, the operator shall not deny the attribution of that decision solely on the ground that it has been adopted by automated means. So as you can see, it's a, it's a mechanism of attribution, but at the same time, it's a mechanism to avoid the abuse, the uncertainty, uh, that the affected person could have in case that is affected negatively by the decision, go against the operator, the bank, you have refused my application. Why? The credit scoring is automatic. I'm sorry, I cannot say more because it's not my decision, it's the credit scoring decision. The idea is to avoid that, to prevent that situation. Why the operator? Why the operator and who is the operator? The operator is a concept that has been precisely formulated for the purpose of um, attribution and is based on two main concepts, control and benefit. My proposal, and has been discussed in the uh, UNCITRAL Working Group 4 a few weeks ago, my proposal is that the operator is the one in control of the system, and that is not neither obvious nor easy to describe because we have a lot of actors involved. We have the producer, we have the software developer, we have the data provider, we have the update providers. Who is indeed the operator? Who is indeed 
Imagine, for example, that we have the ADM in cloud computing. To which extent this problem of localization could even make even more difficult to determine who is responsible for. The operator is the one in control, in control of the uh, automated decision making. And I add a second concept, a second factor, is the one who benefits from the use and the operation of this ADM <laughs> in the context of a particular economic activity. If the bank is using credit scoring, it's the operator. If Amazon is using e-recruiting, it's the operator. If a um, uh, pool of taxes, autonomous taxes, are controlled by uh, automated decision making, it's indeed the operator of that pool who is going to be the operator for these purposes as well. So these two elements, as you can see, ensure that vis-a-vis -vis the affected person, we always know who is the contracting party who is the liable economic actor. That is not so easy when we go to the second principle, because the second principle is not about legal effect. It's not about the attribution of legal effect. It's about the allocation of risk. It's about the allocation of legal consequences of the damages caused by the automated decision making. For example, the Robert Da Vinci used in a hospital that caused body injury to the uh, patient, <coughs> or the autonomous vehicle that is involved in an accident, or the irrecreating autonomous, uh, autonomous decision making that is creating a situation of discrimination against a person on the grounds of race. We are talking about this kind of risk. And here, in my opinion, the question is more problematic because we, are, we have, as you can see here, different cases, different scenarios of risk. We could be in a situation where the problems are related to defect. We could be in a situation where the damage is caused because the ADM system is defective. And that channel the risk directly to the producer. This, this discussion, this possibility is confirmed by the very recent proposal of the European Union when has decided to revise the defective product liability in order to guarantee, in order to embrace artificial intelligence, confirming this artificial intelligence system can be regarded as product. If they are product, they can be defective. If they can be defective, we can apply the liability against the producer. The second possibility, as you can see, is different, is to which extent that defect is a problem related to lack of conformity. So we could be in a situation or in a scenario where the contracting party is, is, is not acting in conformity with the terms and conditions of the contract. And that defect, malfunctioning, mistake, error in the design, or inaccuracy of data, is provoking a situation of lack of conformity, breach of contract. Or we could be in a situation where the distributor of that particular algorithm in Europe, for example, is making available this algorithm in the market in Europe and becomes liable in parallel to the producer. So it's not so evident and so easy to uh, use guiding principle seven in a very, as you can see, a concrete and, and systematic way. We have to open other scenarios. And if I may, Luis, let me just add two or three ideas in order to explain what are the rest, the other, the remaining principle what, uh, I'm trying to, um, to consider the basis no, of this legal framework. Apart from the content of this principle, that I'm sure they are not going to be surprising to any of you because they are related to transparency, explainability, reasonability of the principle. For me, the main question and the, 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 the most difficult uh, issue to solve is what are going to be the legal consequences in case that these principles are not duly implemented by the parties. So, for example, take a look at this principle number four. According to this principle number four, the idea is that the affected person, so the other party, consumer or not, should be aware, should be advised of the fact that is interacting with an automated decision making. So there is an obligation to disclose that that particular decision has to, is going to be adopted by an automated decision making. Why? Why we need that? And this question of why is, is very important because in Europe, with uh, consumer protection in mind, this question is, is natural. No, of course, because the consumer should be in a position to understand that he's dealing with a machine. 
But when we were discussing that point in the uh, UNC-12 Working Group 4, at an international level, in business-to-business -business transaction, that principle is not so obvious. Why? Why, why should know that the other party is using uh, automated decision-making to support the decision to deal or not to deal with me? What is the purpose? Why we need this principle? And what is going to happen if I do not disclose? What is going to be the effect? Nullity? Invalidation of any kind? It's a problem of consent? So what is going to be the effect? That's why I just wanted to show you the kind of principle and start thinking beyond simply this principle as natural, uh, responsible and accountability basis. There are more than that. I would like to discover what are going to be the private law effect. And let me just show you uh, two, probably, yes, these two that uh, I like particularly, the second one. Principle number five is uh, it's called the principle of traceability of decision. And the idea is that in the design, implementation, deployment process of ADM, all the actors involved should comply with the following principle, the following requirement. Decision should be traceable. If needed, when needed, has to be traceable. Why? Because otherwise, we have to assume that we will produce decision that cannot be appealed, that cannot be challenged, that cannot be questioned. And therefore, we are undermining, encroaching upon access to justice. We are going to generate a situation where the affected person is completely defenseless because is unable to reply to that situation. Traceability as, as you can see, a prerequisite, as a possibility. And why we need traceability? for the second principle that I like very much. This second principle tried to promote the idea that automated decision-making should not be excused to adopt unfounded, arbitrary, unreasoned decision. So cannot be a shield, cannot be a world that the operator raise in order to say, I'm sorry, it's too complex, I cannot explain. I'm sorry, it's to totally unpredictable. I cannot follow. So I need traceability, but I need to guarantee that this traceability works in order to guarantee recent decision in all cases. Otherwise, all the rights that we assume that are going to be applicable, if needed, they are not going to be feasible anymore because we will never have the reasons supporting that particular decision. Let me just conclude because there are others example that maybe you might be interested and very happy to discuss, but let me just conclude with this. Future work. One, this principle has been produced and adopted by the European Law Institute, and I'm very, very happy to see how other organizations are indeed being inspired, or at least aligned, that is fascinating in any case, is aligned with the same principle. For example, very recently, the White House of uh, United States of America uh, published a very interesting document that is called Blueprint Artificial Intelligence Bill of Rights that is indeed absolutely aligned with the same idea, reasonability, or reasonableness, traceability, um, transparency, disclosure, etc., with a lot of detail. So what is the future work? The first one is try to reconsider or recontextualize this principle that are in a way clearly from a European Union perspective uh, trying to promote certain values and trying to protect the weak party, recontextualized in international trade. How can we guarantee that automated decision making can be used in a way that is valid and enforceable in international transactions? What do we need? UNCITRAL is working and therefore it's not an obvious response. We have to work on that. The second line of the future work is this idea of responsible algorithm. Should we instill, embed in the use of automated decision making certain values, <clears throat> promoting sustainability, avoiding certain uh, unfair behavior, trying to promote um, certain healthy diet uh, for our smart fridge, for example? Can we do that? It's a good idea. Should we do that? And if so, how? And the first, idea, the first line or the third line of work would be this idea of mm, applying this principle in, a, in consumer contract. What are we going to uh, need to adopt in order to systematically and extensively use automated decision making in our consumer contract? Alexa, a smart coffee maker, a smart fridge that are adopting decision for us 
on our behalf every day. What do we need? And to which extent the existing rules are indeed applicable to this new automated decision-making situation. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to discuss further if you would like any of this principle. Thank you. <laughs>